And I want to thank all of you for coming. We're going to start now. And I, wel I want to welcome you to this empowering session. It's the Unleashing the I Can Mindset. My name is Lance Lee. I was president of the American Club from 2008 to 2012. I was fortunate enough to be able to open this facility. And a few of you in this room were very close to me during that time. And I can't tell you how good that made me feel to be able to cut the ribbon with all the people out there in the Winter Garden. Oh, that was a feeling that I, I wish you could share, but it's like bungee jumping. I remember, I remember going into a friend of mine's room and seeing him have a video of him bungee jumping and asking what it felt like. And he said, you have to do it. There's no way I can tell you what it feels like. And that's how it felt cutting the ribbon here. Anyway, I have four sons. They're all in their 30s. I was made a grandfather on the 10th of February this year. So now I have a granddaughter. She's a half a year old. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. And it felt quite interesting to have my first girl in the family because I have from having four sons. Um, two of them got married, the two middle ones, my second and third got married. Um, my wife has been with me for 40 something years now. And I told myself, why should I make many women happy when I could make one miserable? <laughs> anyway, <laughs> let me tell you how I got started. I came over here, first of all, in the Air Force in 1974. So I've been here 50 years now. And when I first came here in the Air Force, I knew it was going to be my last two years in the service. So I decided, since it's my last two years, let me find something I want to do because I did not want to stay in the service. So I went outside the gate and I found two investment companies. So I joined one of them, told the guy that I wanted to learn about investments, and he asked why. I said, because if someday, if I ever have money someday, I want to know what to do with it. Because no one teaches you really how to work with your money. So I worked with this investment company, did very, very well, and that's where I first came into this I can, I can mindset. Because in the program, they take you through a lot of different, let's say, lessons or exercises. And one of them was where we really had to find out who we were. And it was a private room we went into, and there was only about 10 guys at the time. And we had to do some things there that were very, very interesting, but all of it told us more about who we were. And our facilitator said, basically, whenever you're talking on the phone, if you talk with a smile, people will feel it on the other end. So I'm sure some of you have felt that before, too. If you're smiling, you can tell when someone's smiling. And they said, also, if you like yourself, people can tell. You start to vibrate differently than when you don't like yourself. I worked with this company for about one year. Then I worked with the other company because they offered me down the street. They offered me 2 to 3% more than I was getting with the first company I was with. So I really enjoyed that. Also, during that time, I used to work out at the gymnasium. I was a competitive gymnast in high school from the age of 15 to the age of 18, two years in high school, three years in high school, one year in college. I was a competitive gymnast. So when I went to the bases, I would go into the gyms and I'd work out on their tatami mat rooms here at Yokota Air Force Base. One day I'm working out in the room and I left, after I left, I saw these three little boys watching me. So I left the room and then I came back and realized when I came back, because I'd forgotten something, There's, there he is, Johnny. And he made it. Yay. Here's a seat right here. Come on. Oh, you don't want to be huh? Yeah, okay. okay, all right, all right. What about right here? Yeah, that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> Doesn't want to be in the front of the class. All right. <laughs> so anyway, so I go back to the gym and I see these three little boys trying to do what I was doing. And I was worried about them hurting themselves. So I told them, if you come back every week at the same time. I'll show you how to do what I'm doing. I was doing forward rolls, cartwheels, headstands, back handsprings. Well, the boys came back the next week, but they came back with three of their friends. And then the week after that, they brought their friends. So after a couple of weeks, I had about 15 kids that I was teaching free of charge how to do these forward rolls and cartwheels and stuff. Well, one day, the gym manager comes up to me and he says, we're going to have to charge the kids to come in here to be in your class. And I said, well, that's the end of my class. 
And first of all, who would pay to learn how to do a forward roller or cartwheel? Don't forget, this is back in the early 70s. Gymnastics was not a big deal. And particularly, girls' gymnastics was not big at all. So I thought, who would pay to do this? Well, anyway, he said, look. And I, didn't even, I couldn't even think of what to charge them for. What do you charge for a cartwheel? What do you charge for a forward roller? I couldn't think of what to charge for that. So he said, I'll fill out the, the list. And he did. He filled out this form for them to do. And I guess he charged the same thing they did for karate or something like that. I gave one to all the kids, knowing this would be the last time I would see them. Next week, I come there, knowing no one's going to be there, so I'll get to work out on my own again, finally. All these kids came back, not only with the form and the money in their hand, but they had their parents with them. Now, you're talking about pressure? <laughs> Shoot. I taught the class. When we finished the end of the class, I had all the kids get up and we finished. The parents stood up and gave me a standing ovation. Blew my, teaching four rolls and cartwheels. It blew my mind. But then I realized I must have something going on here. Because what I was trying to do with each one of the kids is what I wished teachers had done with me. Made me feel good about who I am. So I did that with every child through the gymnastics. Because I figured if they really wanted to learn gymnastics, they're going to have to do it more than once a week. But what I can give them, what seed I can plant, is a seed of confidence. And that's how we started the I Can program. Now, what I do in all my programs, I have to go through that with you. And I want all of you to do this with me. I'm going to tell you how our mantra goes, the I Can mantra. Now, on three, I want you to say, not too loud because we have people next door, but I want you to say, I can we count to three. And I have all my kids do this at the beginning of every class. One, two, three. I can. Then I ask the kids, what happens when you say I cannot? The kids say, it makes things harder. Right. What happens when you say I can and you believe it? The kids will say, it makes things easier. Then I'll say, is that only for this class? They say, no, that's for everything. Then I say, here's a trick question. What if I say I can, but I really believe I cannot? The kids say it makes things harder. And I say, why? Because what you believe is stronger than what you say. And I feel like, boom, or I can drop the mic. Because that's all it is. The rest of it is just them going through the motions. If they remember that and use that for the rest of their lives, they'll never have to worry about their confidence again. And that's what their parents are really paying for when they're in my program. I love teaching it because they say, you teach what you need to learn the most. Now, a lot of people like to think that confidence is something that you get when you come to a seminar and you're starting to talk to someone. Confidence to me is like breathing. It's not something you do one time and then you stop. Confidence is like exercise. I can't do a push-up and say, now I'm fit. I listen to motivational tapes regularly. Coming to do this is part of it. And got a full... If you were sitting up here, I could say we have all the seats occupied. This is beautiful. This is something I really look forward to. After I taught those little boys and after I went through the mantra of the I can, there was this class at the high school. Yokota Air Force Base had a gymnastics team and they asked me if I would coach it. So I said, sure. It was a girls' team. Angie Bennett was the only girl on this team that if I spotted her in the first back handspring, she could do the uh, rest on her own. So I made it a point on myself. I said, what we're going to do is, over the weekend, you're going to come in the gym, just you and I, and I'm going to teach you how to do the first one. Well, she comes to the gym one Saturday, and both of us are in there, and I go about spotting her, and she's not able to get it, the first one. I spot her again, and she's not able to do it. About two hours later, me trying everything I could imagine, she does not do the first back handspring on her own. So I'm getting to my wit's end, basically, and I put my hand behind her and said, Angie, come on, you can do this back handspring. Look at how many you've done without, without me. Just do the first one. And she said, Mr. Lee, I can't. And for some reason, it hit me. Now, she'd been saying I can't the whole time, but it hit me. I ran outside the gym. The football field was right there. I run and do round off, back handspring, back handspring, back flip. Angie Bennett thought that I'd lost my mind, <laughs> that I didn't want to work with her anymore because she wouldn't do the first one. 
But what had happened was I realized something that I learned from my investment company. They said, if you're working with someone, and let's say you're trying to get them to sign a contract because you're financially planning them, if you can get people to say enough yeses, it's hard for them to say no when it comes time for you to say, now I want you to sign right here. They won't go like this. So the same thing would apply. If I could get her to say, I can, it'd be difficult for her to say, I can't. So I said, Angie, I know what it's going to take for you to get your first back handspring. All you have to do is say, I can. She said, but I can't. I said, that's okay. Just say you can. So she agreed. I spot her. She says, I can. She does the back handspring. Then I say, let's do it again. So she does it. Then I said, I'm going to do one finger. She said, okay, I can. And she does it. Then I said, Angie, now I'm going to step back here. She said, I can't. And she did it. I said, I'm done. That was it. That made me really solidify this I can belief because it's hard to say something or to do something over and over and over and change gears real quick. It's really difficult. They say that most of your emotional makeup is made between the age of birth to age 12. Your emotional makeup is there, how you feel about most things. The rest of it's just education. You start learning things. But how you feel about money is already made up. How you feel about religion is already made up. How you feel about adults, children. All that's made up by the time you're 12, basically. That's what psychologists say. Unless something traumatic happens, like some, you, know, you have something really bad happen to you, an accident or somebody dies. Other than that, your emotional makeup is already made up. Now, you can start to change it, but it takes time. It really takes time to do that. Oh, good, good, good. <laughs> um, understanding the power of belief. Did I go through that? That's, let me say. I'm supposed to be working both things. Is that it? Understanding the power of belief. I remember when I was a little kid, and I was watching television. I was watching a black and white TV. I'm that old. Elvis Presley comes on. All of you know who Elvis Presley is? All right. He jumps out of his helicopter. I'm paraphrasing some of this. Someone throws him a guitar. Beautiful woman standing beside him. Whoa, don't step on my blue suede shoes. And I'm standing right there in front of the TV. Whoa, boy, I want to be just like him when I grew up. But I can't. I went to bed, no one had told me, my parents weren't the type that would say anything about race or anything like that, but for some reason I knew I couldn't be like Elvis Presley. I went to bed that night with tears in my eyes. In Catholic schools, you're taught about purgatory, that's between heaven and hell. That night, I said, God, please let me die and go to purgatory, because I knew I wasn't good enough to go to heaven. So let me go to purgatory and come back the way I want to be. So I thought about who I wanted to be if I went to purgatory and came back. <clears throat> my dad? No. My Uncle Bobby, he's a policeman. No, that's too dangerous. <gasps> Superman? I, no, 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 because that's fake anyway. I could see those strings holding him up. I know Tarzan. No, 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 no. He's going through the jungle, and why should he be the only one that can speak to these animals? And the guys that live there can't. Hercules. He's a little bit darker because he'd been tanned and he was strong. I want to be Hercules. No. And all of a sudden, my tears dried up and I realized who I wanted to be. You'll never guess who it is. Me. At a young age, I decided I wanted to be me. How many people ever say that? Because the person who gives you the hardest time in your life is the person you see every time you look in the mirror. That person does not like you. That person tells you things that you wouldn't even say to your worst friends, to your enemies. It picks on you. It knows where your moles are that you don't like. It knows the way your nose is shaped, the way your ears are shaped, the way your hair is out of place. It tells you all these negative things. Something else I want all of you to do. Stand up right now. Everyone stand up for a second. And I want you to give the person next to you a high five and feel good about it. Just give them a high five. Come on. High five. All right. Now you can sit down. Sit down. Sit down. That's enough. Sit down now. <laughs> now let me ask you something. When you gave that person next to you a high five, how did it make you feel? 
Did it make you feel good? How many of you, there's someone I talked, someone I just got through listening to. I tell you, I listen to motiv motivational tapes all the time. This is a woman by the name of Meg Robbins. And she has the five, was it five, the high five, was a high five quest or high five exercise where she looks in the mirror every morning and gives herself high five. How many of you think you could look in the mirror and say that you really liked yourself? Raise your hands. Who can look in the mirror and say you like yourself? Like or love? Like, like. <laughs> Let's just try like. Look in your eyes and sincerely really say, look in there, I like you, and mean it. Okay. Now, most people, now this is something I found out, really. I find most Japanese don't have a hard time with that because of the way your society is built up. Ware ware, which you'd really know. But the younger kids aren't taught that word, but they're taught that action because of schools. But everyone else, Europeans, well, some Europeans are really good. Americans, we're taught not to like ourselves for the most part. We're beat up. I don't care what ethnicity you are. If you live in America for a generation, you're going to come out of there not feeling good because someone's already told you why you shouldn't feel good about yourself. If it, if it wasn't your parents, it was somebody else. You learn real quick, I don't, I'm not supposed to like me, and if I do, I'm too arrogant, I'm self-centered, I'm... All of that. No, that's what happens to you. And don't look like you think you feel good about who you are. So it's really interesting. If I told you I won a lot, or I had a lot of money, and I just got through spending, let's say, $500,000, having a good time. All I did was just partied. I did whatever I wanted to do. Just took off time and just enjoy it. I spent $500,000, half a million dollars, having a good time. What would you think? You'd think, how dare you spend that kind of money having a good time? What kind of person are you? What if I said I was sick and I had cancer and I knew I may not live long and it cost me $500,000? That's okay, right? If I spent the money there? Isn't that messed up? Isn't that messed up? It's okay for me to be almost dying and sick, but when I'm healthy, I'm not supposed to enjoy myself. How dare you feel good and use your money when you're in good health? But if you're sick and your leg fell off or something, oh, yes. Spend whatever it takes. I understand that. That's how our society basically trains us. Not to feel good. You'll give it to other people, but not to yourself. But when you give it to yourself, guess what? You do start to vibrate different. Your attitude starts to show. People can sense. Animals, first of all, can tell. You get up to a horse or something, you're nervous and you're afraid and you're not, they'll, mm, mm. little kids. The reason why I still teach kids in my program is because kids are so candid, they haven't learned to have any facade yet. Their position doesn't mean anything. They know, I'm a little boy, I'm a little girl, and I don't like you, and I can't express why, or I like you. And I can't express why, but I'll show you, you know, and that's something I really Enjoy. Because right now, a lot of you think I'm trying to teach you something. The truth is, I'm not trying to teach you a thing. I'm trying to help you remember. Because all of you know what I'm saying already. If it's affecting you any way whatsoever, it's because you already know. But we need to hear it over and over and over again. The older I get, the more I want to listen to it. Because it makes me think that well, I'm really, I can really look in the mirror and say I love you. It's hard as hell. <laughs> it's hard as hell. Because I know all the things that aren't right. But it's really hard. But I can say it and I forgive him. I forgive everything he's done. I'm going to try to do my best to make sure that he enjoys himself. It's not easy. But you have that attitude. So my thing that I want to spread throughout the world is the I can attitude. If you have an I can attitude, there's nothing you can lose. Nothing you can lose on that. This woman, like I said, make. Robbins, she has the high five, and she says each time she comes in, one, one illustration she gave was really good. You know, like when you're getting ready to go meet someone, one of your friends or something, you're going to a coffee shop or someplace, and you know just before you're about to see them, when you come around the corner, that feeling you get inside, and then you see their face and you go, you feel good? What if that happened every time you got up in the morning and you got ready to go into your restroom or whatever, and just before you come in to look in the mirror to see yourself, you got that kind of feeling because you're going to see yourself. When you get that, you're getting closer. When you have that kind of feeling, when you feel good seeing yourself, even though your hair is not right because you were sleeping all night 
whatever it may be. But you start to like yourself and you forgive yourself for all of that. Because it's not about what you're doing or what's happening on the outside. It's what's happening on the inside. It's so much the inside that makes more than anything else. We're on a spiritual journey. It's not a physical one. We don't know what it is, but we do know it's something inside, and we're not taught how to work with it. I get really frustrated the fact that we spend so much money on AI and nothing on HI, human intelligence. If we did, I wouldn't need this doggone phone. I'd be doing it like this, and you'd get it. I'd be able to move the chairs without having people to, really. We have, we're, this is five, I have five volts of electricity going through my body, am I right? That's why you can get sin dinky from going like this and do that. If you learn how to work that, there's so much stuff you can do, but we like to think it's coincidence, it's happenstance. I didn't, I, I was thinking about the person, I just saw them, oh, that was just an accident. No, it was not. I don't believe in accidents like that. I don't think that at all. The concept, let me see, introducing the concept of cognitive reframing, for example, how you think is so important. Thinking about this little boy that was on a bus. He's sitting down on the school bus and he's getting ready to get up. And these bullies come up to him and push him down. And he tries to stand up again and they push him down again. He tries one more time to stand up and they just hold him down. And he says to them, you might be holding me down on the outside, but inside I'm standing strong. No one can control how you decide to think about something. I had a friend once, I said, if I step on your foot, who's, respons who's responsible for how, you feel, for how you feel? That person said, you are. How am I responsible for it? Because you hurt my foot. But what if you were a masochist and you liked it? Am I responsible for that too? Have you guys ever seen The Little Shop of Horrors with Steve Martin? Those of you that saw it, <laughs> Bill Murray was in the dentist's office <laughs> and Steve Martin was the dentist and he went in and pulled out his teeth and Bill Murray started, ah, but he loved it. Oh, he loved having the, the pain of his tooth being pulled out. Oh, and Steve Martin was trying to give him pain and he said, you're sick. But he, he loved it because no one can control how you decide to take a situation, how you decide to feel about it. My pet peeve, cab drivers. The way I reframe the thought in my mind is this. Unfortunately, sometimes I tend to get the ones that aren't good to stop wherever they want to. But the majority must be good. I reframe my mind and say, the majority of the cab drivers must be good to pass the test to become cab drivers. And that goes to this too. In the positions I've been in, over the chamber and over the American club, whenever you find yourself in a position of leadership, what happens is what you're really doing is painting a bullseye on yourself. And you're gonna feel the negatives more than you do the positive. You're gonna feel the negative comments, the negative air, you're gonna feel that more than you do the positive. How you decide to frame it in your mind is gonna make all the difference on how you're gonna do. In your positions, those of you that happen to be out front, you're gonna feel it because you're the easier target. But when you're in a position where they really feel you're the person that they have to go to to ask the questions, you have to decide how you're going to take it. The way I handled it mostly was, I'm not mad at the person. I'm upset at their actions. And I can decide to think how they're, what they're saying means to me. Now, there's some people that like to continue to say the same thing over and over and over and over again. Now, if I know they're going to do that and I've heard it, I change their voice in my head. And they sound like this to me. But I'll look at them like this. And that's how I can get through that. Because I've heard it enough. This has happened too many times. And it's not that big a deal, but I still want them to feel good about what they've said. And I go through it. So you have to learn to reframe things in your mind, or I learned to reframe them in a positive way and not take it on the person, but on the action. What is the action? How do I deal with that? And having said that, I'm going to end and let you guys get a drink of water like I'm going to, or go to the restroom or something, because we're like halfway through, are we? Mm -hmm. Kind of close to it. So please get a drink of water or something, go to the restroom if you need to. I'm going to give you a few seconds to do that, and then we're going to go to the next thing, which is...
Or do you, do you do that or you don't do that? People don't go to the restroom. No one needs to go to the restroom. You just want to sit here and go through. You're going to push me through. Okay. All right, all right, all right, all right. Nobody wants to? All right, then I have one more thing after this. This is this. Then why don't we do this real quick? Okay. Scan that. Take out your iPhone. Take out your phones and scan that because we're going to go through the part of how I cultivate an I can mindset. No, I have water. I'm good. I'm good. I'm getting sweaty because I think it's just getting hotter. Maybe I'm. Now, what I want you to do, now that you've scanned that, this is a little gift to you. Please keep it. Find a phrase in there that you like. Find one phrase that you like. A quote. Read some of the quotes and find one that you like. Do you find something in there? Can you see the quotes? Find something that you like. And I just want a couple of you to share it with me. And tell me what you think about your quotes. Now, this is something I do. Now, this comes from a very, very well-known, if you get into motivational speaking, speaker, Zig Ziglar. He's passed now, but he was very well-known and did it for quite a while. But these phrases, some of them are my favorite. But just read them, and you'll see some that are very good. And just doing that, small sentences, but they have so much impact. Find one that you like. It's like when you're in a restaurant and people start eating. Just lunchtime or dinner. I was talking before then, then after that. Everyone, do you have something? Does everyone have something that you like? Okay. Can someone share something they liked? Give me, give me a phrase. You want to give me something? Yeah, sure. So actually, a lot of sentences are great. Aren't they? Probably the best is for myself. Ostaku uh, are the things we see when we take our eyes off of our goals. That's amazing. One more time. Sorry. <laughs> so no, it's just me. It's my yeah, I'm... Obstacles are okay. the things we see when we take our eyes off of our goals. goals. Yes, obstacles are the things we see when we take our eyes off our goals. Very small sentences like that. Leon knows because when I was um, over this club, we had a presence insight, and every month, sometimes twice a month, when I really felt the need. We would, I would always add a phrase in there from some positive quote that I have. Now, there's one that I really like. It goes like this. There's only three types of people in this world. Those that make things happen, those that watch things happen, and those that wonder what happened. You want to make sure you're in the first group, the ones that are making things happen. The fact is, you wouldn't be in here, it's not by accident, unless you wanted to make things happen. This is no coincidence. You want to make things happen, or you wouldn't take the, take the trouble to even try to find out what's out there. What are you doing? And I say that for everyone that happens to be in this building. This is very unique. Does anyone else have something that they want to say? Anyone have anything good? Jason? Because you did you find anything in there? Oh, all of them are the ones. The, world. the three types of people in the world. <laughs> Those that can count. Those that what? Can count. The can count. And those that cannot. <laughs> He's good. <laughs> now that is good. I like that. <laughs> and you know what category he's in, right? <laughs> Anyone else? One more. One more. Give me some. Thank you. Attitudes we can acquire, surely the attitude of gratitude is the most important and by far the most life challenging. Wow. Of all the attitudes we can require, by sure, the one of what? Gratitude. Of gratitude is the, most important. is the most important. And that is true because some of the motivational tapes I listen to, they say this. They say that when you're asking for something, like for example, if you say, I want, the universe will make that happen for you because whatever you ask for, you really do get. If you say, I want more money, you know what will happen? You will continually get what the universe said they would give you, the want. You will never get the money. 
you'll always want more money because that's what you've asked. But if you have gratitude for having what you have, that's when things start to change. Or you say, I have, or I am. Those are powerful statements. But I want, or please give me. See, I think like this. I think what you are is God's gift to you. What you become is your gift to God. You had a one in a 400 trillionth of a chance of becoming a human being. One in 400 trillionth of a chance. If you don't believe me, ask Chad or Siri. And she will tell you right now, if you say, Siri, what are the chances of me becoming a human being? she say one in a 400 trillion. And that's not even accounting your mother and father meeting each other <laughs> in the same order. One, you know how special you are because of that. That, for me, says it all. And all of us have power, but we're told not to have it. We're told different things. I don't want to go about how I feel about religion and stuff, but I do feel this way. I'm not religious, but I'm very spiritual. Because whatever there is, is something that none of us can identify or talk about any more than any of us in here can give the highest number there is. If you can't give the highest number, how can you talk about something greater than that? You know, you can't even think about it, to be honest. <laughs> and that's how I feel about it. But something we have in ourselves, and I think that we're all connected. I think we make the divisions. I have a belief that at one time it was really a matriarchy, that women basically ran everything, and men were the ones that lifted heavy things and made sure they had children, took care of the kids. Then we got upset about that. This is just my, in my imagination. Then we got upset and said, okay, we've got to get some of this power because we can't vote or anything. Women figured we were too dumb to do it. So we created something. We called it the devil. Now, I know I'm getting a little far out there, <laughs> but we had to protect our woman against this devil, and the devil was a man, okay? And the man had to do it. So then we stopped talking about goddesses. We started talking about having a god. It was supposed to be a man. And then it became a patriarchy. And during the time when it was a matriarchy, I think women basically made sure that men did nothing other than lift heavy things and take care of the kids, basically. Now, we've turned it around, and we went that way. We didn't stop women from doing things. You know, we let them continue to work with it, didn't we? No, <laughs> we basically stopped them from everything. We took, we took out the same thing they did us, we did to them. <laughs> but that's something I like to play with in my head. I don't know if it's real or not. But I do believe we're all one, and we're all very necessary, regardless of how we want to look at it. I want to show you something here. I took a trip. Is it here? No. I had some life decisions. What I did is I wrote down on a piece of paper all my life decisions. Here they are. Um, joining the gymnastics team at age 15. I didn't start gymnastics until I was 15 years old, which is kind of old. Riding across the United States on my motorcycle when I was 18 years old. Joining the United States Air Force. I was actually drafted, so I... Join. I had to. I, I had to take a test to get in because I didn't want to go to Vietnam. Um, extending my term in the U.S. so that I could come here to Japan because I didn't have enough time to come here, so I had to extend another eight months to get Japan and do a two-year tour. And I was willing to do it because I hadn't been outside the continental United States, and I wanted to see what it was about. And I was going to come over here. I remember that I was going to come over here and teach the Japanese who I knew had rickshaws and kimonos and little grass hats. I'm going to teach them how the modern world works. <laughs> I remember coming in on the plane, and we came in to land at Yokota Air Force Base. I remember looking outside the window and seeing these itty-bitty cars and trucks. And then I remember when we landed, there were still itty-bitty cars and trucks. But, <laughs> but this place had mom-and-pop shops had electric doors, and our major hotels in the United States then did, didn't. Everything was organized. Everything was neat and clean. I said, somebody, the cabs had automatic doors that opened. I said, somebody lied to me about this country. It changed my whole perception about Japan, as I'm sure it did many of you that hadn't come here before. Or I hadn't been here. Then, after coming here, then I, um, I became an investment consultant, advisor, um, becoming a teacher at the American School. I taught at the American School for three years, physical education. And then I went on to teach at other schools, but through my company. I got married in 1986, um, formed my second company, which is TRG. It was um, the, the largest medical equipment, used medical equipment business in Japan for six years, and I had it for 10 years. 
I did this for 10 years. I bought used CT scanners here in Japan, and I sold them to other countries. And that was, I'll tell you a little bit about that story too. Changing my title on my name card was part of that company that I started. And all this had to do with, I already had this I can attitude, so I applied it to everything I went into. Because I remember starting my first company, IGC, which stood for International Gymnastics Club. Now I call it Instruction, Guidance, and Care. When I went to the um, city office to start my company, he said, son, you're too, too young. Why don't you wait until you get a little bit older? And I said, well, we have surgeons that are in their late 20s. And he said, maybe you should wait. It wasn't until I got in my 40s and 50s I understood what he was talking about. But I started my company in my early 20s. I mean, my late 20s. And I stayed with it. Um, joining TAC in 1988. I became a member in 1988. And I didn't join on the premise of just wanting to be a member. I was a little vindictive. And there was someone whom thought I worked for him. So I thought one way for me to show him I don't work for him is to become a member. <laughs> and I did. And that changed everything right away. So I no longer work for him. <laughs> and it was quite interesting. Let me see. Um, running for the ACCJ president in 2002. I became president of the American Chamber in 2003. Running for TAC president in 2007. I was president from 2007 to 2012. Um, getting my Japanese. Oh, got the motorcycle license. What I did was I had a motorcycle once I came over here. I started riding. I've been riding motorcycles since I was 10 years old. And I made my first motorcycle when I was around 10, 11 years old out of a lawnmower engine with a bicycle frame and big fan belts. And I did that for several years. And then at 15, I was able to buy my first Honda. It was a 175 Honda monocross. I thought it was a dirt bike, but that was the last thing it was. I was in the dirt a lot, but it wasn't because of the bike. It was because that bike was made for the dirt. Then at 17, I bought myself a 750 Honda. And that's the one I rode across country, which I'm going to tell you about a little bit. But when I bought the, when I bought the um, Honda, when I got the 750 Honda, what was I going to tell you about that part? Let me see. I just lost my train of thought. So, oh, the O got the license. Getting my O got the license here, it took me, after I came here and rode my motorcycle here, when my second son was born and I just joined the club, I was leaving the club and a cab opened his door and almost caught me. It almost got me. And I thought, I should get rid of my motorcycle until my son becomes an adult because I don't want him to have a father who, you know, is maimed because of, I couldn't stop riding my bike. So I said, when my last child turns 20, I'll get another motorcycle. So when my youngest son, my fourth son turned 19, I ordered my bike that I have now. It's a 2300cc. It's the biggest production bike you can get. It's called a Rocket 3 Triumph. Some of you may have seen it when I brought it here. But I ride that, and I've been all around Japan. The only island I've been around outside of Okinawa is Kyushu. But I've been around Honshu, Hokkaido several times, and Shikoku. I love Shikoku. We were talking about that today. That's you spent your time. That's fantastic. So anyway, I, I got the bike then, but it took me 50 times to pass that test because I said I'm not Japanese and every time I came I'd go through the test and I knew I was doing it right but I would not take the lessons because I know how to ride the bike and guys were passing who didn't do it I could. they couldn't even pick up the bike some of these guys and they were passing but I didn't know they had taken the test so I go through this and every time I stand in front they say gokaku shinai and I'm thinking, huh? And I'd say, why? And they're not supposed to, they don't have to tell you why you don't pass. They don't have to say a thing about that. But I went and they started to tell me, and I remember the 14th time was, was the biggest telling time. I go through the whole test. I went through the, um, you have to go on, you have to do stuff they do in Cirque du Soleil <laughs> to be able to get a license here. So I ride my bike across the balance beam slower than I need to. You have to do it in 10 seconds. I did it in 12 something seconds because I was that good. And then I go through the, the cones and did everything stop right and stuff. And this is the 14th time. He gets up there. He says, Lisa, go kaku shinai. And they never had any expression. I said, ah. I said why? Because we were friendly now. They knew who I was. I'm the guy that keeps on coming there. I'm the oldest guy there. They knew me. And they had me translating for some of the other foreigners that came there. So I said, why? And he said, hekindai no tokini. He said, when you, on, when you are on the hekindai, you know you're supposed to have both feet forward like this. You had your left foot a little bit to the side. And I looked at him like this and said, Hi, okay, Master. 
And I walked away, got behind the building. I said, oh, shit. I went nuts. I was so mad. But he didn't see me do that, but I went behind the building to do it. Fifteenth time, I go through the whole test, and I'm saying I can all the time, so you can say it all you want, <laughs> and you have to believe it. And I believed it every time. I'm fifteenth because I told myself I'd only do this ten times, but I just something inside me said I cannot stop. Eleventh time, twelfth, and then fifteenth, and I have to pay every time. It's not that much, but it adds up. Fifteenth time, I go through. And everyone, this time, no kidding, I was the last one to go through and everyone's watching. Everyone decided to stay and watch. They could have left because they'd heard about me. Most people, the most they do is seven times. I'm on my 15th and they're talking, oh, did you go kind of that? What's going to happen? And the guy looks at me and I'm standing up there and I just know he's not going to pass me. He said, Lisa, go kaku shimashita. I fell down to, listen, I fell down to my knee and I couldn't, I couldn't help it. I started crying. And I thought it was a trick. I thought he was kind of tricking me. Because I know you. <laughs> really? And they're all patting me on the back and stuff. You better... <laughs> I was just, I could not believe it. I go into, this is something I love about Japan. Because the police in the main building would always ask, Lisan, go kakushimashita. I go in there, and they say, Lisan, don't this guy said, go kakushimashita. They came out of their room and, oh my God! Oh, man, you're talking about making me want to cry. I said, I'm never leaving this country. That made me feel so good. They said, we threw everything at you. We stopped you for everything, and you kept on coming back. You kept on coming back. We're going to give it to you. And that made me respect this country so much. Because one guy, he, you know, it passes fifth time, and then he starts arguing, and he want to act like he's my friend. I said, get away from me. Why do you have to be close to me when you're mad? And he's talking to the police and this way and stuff. This is not my country. I'm a visitor here. I feel like it's anything else, too. If I come into your home and I bring a gift, you probably bring me, invite me over again, right? But if I only come to your home with an appetite, why would you want to give me anything? I hate it. This is getting off the course a little bit, but I hated watching TV shows where they'd have the foreigners up there talking about Japan. That's the dumbest thing in the world. Go home. You don't like Japan? Go home. I didn't, say, nobody, I didn't think the emperor wrote you a letter saying, please come. If you don't like the place, go home. But if you can come here and add something, then please. But don't come here complaining. And I say that about American too. People that come to America do not complain. <laughs> you come in here, if you have something to offer, good. If you don't, go home. But if you have that I can attitude and you're willing to share it and work along with it, no problem. Everybody wants to continue. Nobody's going to stop here, Mika. They're, they're not that tight. <laughs> All right, let's go through the riding across the U.S. <clears throat> How did I do this? 18 years old. That's the picture taken in New Jersey. That's when my hair was short. <laughs> I had a helmet I'd put on. We're going across the country. 23 states now. 23 states. My father got upset when I told him I was going to cross. I customized the bike, too. The back tire isn't a normal tire. It's a big tire, and it's one that you can put a, a, um, a VW inner tube in, because I figured if we got a flat tire. We had two flat tires, and we went through two rainstorms. The guy that rode with me had a, not this, he had the 550, which was four cylinders and smaller. I was 18. He was 21. He's since passed. I have found him on Facebook, and he's passed away about two years ago. And I hadn't seen him after the, since the trip. Now, he said something to me during the trip, because I'm the one that planned everything. It started off, the trip was supposed to be five of us going across. All of us had 750s. All of us had customized our bikes. All of us had part-time jobs. I worked in the liquor store. Saved up my money. Throughout the year, guys started dropping off. Finally, the last month, the last guy said, oh, I can't make it. I'm still going to go, because I'm the one that really wanted to go. <clears throat> my father said, why don't you just go up to Oregon, since I'm from California. Just go up north. I want to go across. My mother lived in New Jersey. And that gave me a good target. A week before I was to leave, this guy by the name of um, Roger, Roger Tishner, Marshall Tishner, the one that passed away, who's 21, went to high school with me, but he was older than me, so he was in some of the great, I mean, I, he graduated way before I did, of course. But we were in drama class at one time together, so I knew him from that. I see him on his bike, and I pull up to, his, to the front of his home, and he was talking to some friends, saying that he was getting ready to go to Evansville, Indiana which is like middle of the U.S. 
And he was going to be taking off the next week. And I said, I'm going to New Jersey. I'll tell you what, I'll ride with you to Evansville. And then I'll go on to New Jersey. And he said, guess what? I'll go with you. If, you, if your mother says, okay, I'll go with you all the way to New Jersey. So we did. We went all the way to New Jersey, came all the way back. And I must tell you something else, which is outside of the ICANN. I believe in UFOs because on the East Coast, you were riding on the parkway when you're not supposed to do this on motorcycles. But no one told us. We didn't know how to get to D.C. otherwise. I see something up in the sky. I tell Roger, I mean, I tell Marshall, we pull over. We see something up there, and it's just shiny and staying still. And I thought it was a helicopter at first, but it wasn't moving. Then all of a sudden it goes, choo, 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 and the vapor trails were just erratic and just, poof, it took off. When we get to D.C., everyone on the East Coast, many people saw it, so they reported the same thing I saw. So I know that was a UFO because we don't have planes that move like that. So I've seen one, and that was when I was 18 years old, and it wasn't because I was riding too long either. <laughs> but anyway, it was good. So we made it all the way across, all the way back, and it was a fantastic trip. Now moving on to when I decided to start the scanner business. When I started the scanner business, this is one of the CT scanners, those of you that know what a CT scanner is, and that's in one of our warehouses, and I was in my early 30s then, Yokogawa Medical is the one that owned the company, but actually GE owned it, but no one knew about GE in Japan, so all the scanners were called Yokogawa Systems instead of GE. Now everyone doesn't hear about Yokogawa, they only hear about GE. Because GE, even at that time, owned 75% of the company, Yokogawa only owned 25%. So I'm taking out these scanners. This would happen. And it took an attitude because I was very arrogant, because I had made some money and I knew I was the man. I had my name card, and I met a friend who said, am I making any money? After a year, he'd known me for about a year after I started the company. And I said, yes. He said, come on, be honest. Are you making any money doing this? And I said, well, not yet. And he said, can I give you some advice? I said, sure. He said, you see your name card? You have it in both. And the biggest thing on there is your name and your title, Lance E. Lee, President. And not enough attention on that, on this. And he said, you said you go to these hospitals and you speak to them in Japanese, right? And I said, yes. Now, he happened to be African. And he was doing um, decatheters, which are systems, medical, Nipro. Have you ever heard of Nipro? Anyway, so Nipro systems. So he had that, and he was sending it to the Middle East. He said, Lee San, first of all, the Japanese have never seen a black person that owns a business to take out the biggest asset in their hospital. Stop saying you're president. Say that you're the marketing director and technician, or both, and hire someone to translate for you. Wakabashi-san, she's been with me for almost 30 years now, and she used to work here. Used to work here. Anyway, I'm not stealing anybody. I'm just kidding. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> so what we did the second year, little success story with an I can attitude, we went into the hospitals because when I went in there on my own and spoke in Japanese and gave my name card and did everything, the intro of the hospital would listen to me and he thought, wow, fantastic, well, it was great. But I'm sure as soon as I went out the door, he took the card and just threw it away because no one ever called me. When I went in differently and gave my name card and I'd say, Watakshi wa Lansley Desu and give my name card and then sit down and let Wakabashi san do the rest and I would sit there nice and properly, and look at her and act like I don't understand the thing he's saying, we cleaned up. I had three partners in the U.S., and we all made that second year one big one each. We all made one with, three, with six, six, at the end of, six zeros at the end of it each that second year in profit because I shut up swallowed my pride, and it doesn't matter who owns my company because in my position, I can be any place I want to be. And I'm not telling anything that's not true. And it worked. And they were happy because they felt they had one, someone there that could not speak the language, and it was entertaining, and it was like a show, and they didn't care, and it was beautiful. It was a beautiful experience to be able to go through that. But it took an attitude, and the attitude that I had basically was not to feel so confident that I couldn't take the advice from someone who clearly had very good advice. Okay? Now what I want us to do is this. Is it, can I, should I talk now? Is it okay if I talk now? I know it's a few minutes. Before we finish, 
I want to give a special thanks out to our GM, Mr. Morish, for allowing this to happen. HR Jason, Arissa, IT Justin for coming in here, making sure that happened. I want to thank all the people who helped make set up the, the chairs and everything in here. And I want to thank all of you for making the experience for all of the members in here and yourselves such a pleasant one. We couldn't be with a better set of people, honestly. I think it's fantastic. And don't forget, at the end of this, the three things that are important, self-love, don't forget about that, your mindset, and taking care of yourselves. I didn't get enough into about your physical fitness part of it, and I will end with this here. Remember, the power of I can lies not just in the words, but in the belief behind you. Believe in yourself, take action, and watch the world transform. I can make power of the 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 power you know exactly what I'm speaking. What are you talking about? Shoot. I even have some Russian I could throw out there. Shoot. Just for those of you that don't know, this is I this is AI. So it's not me. I do not speak all these languages that fluently. I don't speak that fluently. <laughs> but it's AI. And there's 27 languages I can speak because of this. So there's one young lady here that's from um, Czechoslovakia. So I have Czech on there. Blew her mind. If you heard my Russian, it would blow your mind. But it looks so natural. It looks so real and so natural. And I decided to dress the same way so that you think that it would, you know, I did that day. But this is AI. And it just goes to tell you, the thing is, all the things you guys can get on you can get on Google and Google any problem you want right now, but all that doesn't matter. You can get hundreds of thousands of different people giving you advice. But let me tell you one thing that's going to make the difference. You have to add action. If you don't add action to an I can attitude, it won't work. It's like putting all the ingredients in there and just watching it. You've got to stir. <laughs> so if you do that, it's good. But thank you so much. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. At the end, I usually say this. At the end of my podcast, I always say, never forget, it's all on loan, including this body. So continue to reach for the stars because you're too blessed to be stressed. Oh! Yeah. Hallelujah! Thank you.